cultures. But why are there no memorials, films, stories for the most part about all these other consequences that Johnny talked about? Yes. Well, maybe one thing too, because Hollywood portrays the war. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't really portray stories like you just talked about, about that. The families, what they went through, like mm -hmm. what families are, went through in Iraq or in Afghanistan or Vietnam, any of those wars. Normally you, you hear like Rising with the Sun or all these other movies that it's just basically the war. Mm -hmm. What we want to see, what people, you know, what people want to see. People want to see, you know, what happened to a family, you know, in Vietnam or you know, Hollywood doesn't portray it, so we're not really interested in stuff. Right, so it's, I mean, it's, it's kind of screwing too. Hollywood doesn't show it, Yeah, maybe if there is, it's right. not a, a big deal. People right. don't really, you know, like, oh, we want to go see that movie. Right. So, so yeah, I mean, so on one hand, the, the stories simply yeah, aren't out there for us to even think it's about these things. It's a big deal for people. Yeah. Okay. Which I think, usually, the Hollywood, to go off that point, they try to dramatize the war hero, or maybe, you know, the, the ultimate, like, American war victim, whereas they don't really into the stories of, of the countries and the families that were damaged on, on you know on other shores or back home the people that that were severely damaged by the fact that their family members were going to war and may not come back right but why why is that I well because it's easy to make a superhero movie you know you know the people that go over there and you know that that maybe accomplished something great in battle or, or just dealt with something intense you know, you know just don't have the mindset to, to care about the people on the other side that were damaged. Okay. I'll use the term identification. Yeah. As superheroes, that's fine, too. We want, we want to identify with the superhero. We want to identify with the hero. We want to identify with the man who, who does the killing. Right. No one wants to identify with the person who's going to get killed, right? Right. You watch an anti-war movie, supposedly, and you see people getting killed and stuff. How many people here identify with the victim in those things? I mean, it's better to identify with the guy doing the killing, even if you have to live with the killing afterwards, right? You're still alive. You're still alive. No one wants to identify with dead people. You want to identify with living people. So this is part of what happens in telling certain kinds of war stories. War is hell, but we're still alive. That's the other part of it, too. Uh, I was saying it's also a topic that's not really, uh, I just use the word, like, it's not really a sexy topic. You know what I mean? Like, the idea of, like, a, a Vietnam veteran, of someone who died fighting for their country is, like, a, an idea that, like, a, you know, people, like, can respond to that idea, they can relate to that idea, but the the veteran who comes back and you know kills himself because he couldn't deal with it, or the veteran who comes back and becomes homeless or like an alcoholic, like that's a topic that's like doesn't really have. There's that's why there's no. I, I think there's no memorial to those yeah. veterans because it's just not a topic that people want to talk about. They're just like as long as you're back, you're fine. Why don't they want to talk about it? Like I said, it's just not a, a sexy topic. You know, like they like to remember, you know, like the, the hero who died. You know, fighting, like holding the flag, and you know. That, they, that idea to them, like, they can stand behind that. I, I don't know why, I just kind of like... Well, I mean, think, I mean, think about it. If, you, if you've grown up and you played, you, you're a boy or a girl, a girl now, and play soldier, you fantasize about living or, or dying, right? Dying is actually okay, but you imagine you die in some glorious way. Yeah. You don't imagine, oh my, sh oh, my legs are blown off, I'm still alive. No one, no one wants to play that game. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right? So, yeah, this is again part of the way that a certain kind of war story contains meaning. We, and this is, I don't think the United States is unique. We want to remember soldiers. We want to remember men. We want to remember uh, the living and the dead. But we don't want to remember all the messy stuff of uh, suicides, divorces, trauma, homelessness, etc., etc., which are inevitably part of every kind of war. But if we ever talked about it, we wouldn't find anybody who wants to go to war. I mean, if you, if you from kindergarten, were, were told, well, you know what? It's heroic and patriotic to join the military. But just be prepared for all these various kinds of consequences, like you smoke cigarettes to see the consequences. Maybe we should have a little card that says, here are the various consequences, side effects of joining the military, not just getting killed, but you know, coming back without organs or healing for, for something like that. But I think the government, I mean, and I'm not defending them, there is a need for them to feed the war mm -hmm. machine. And so you feed it with what you think is going to keep keep growing it. Mm -hmm. So, and I think we all do that in our lives to a certain extent. Right. We feed what we want to grow. Right. It's called ideology. Exactly. And I know that you know Hollywood is often held up as sort of a punching bag. We make jokes about Hollywood and stuff. It's pretty serious though, because you know communist countries need propaganda, and we can point to that and say, oh, that's just propaganda that they're spewing forth in socialist realism and stuff like that. 
We have the most powerful propaganda machine in the world. It's called Hollywood. We, do. we don't need the government to tell Hollywood what to do because the power of ideology is so strong that Hollywood's already on board for the most part. So the Vietnam War movie is sort of an exception in terms of how it's shown the dark side of war. But nevertheless, it's still a part of the machinery of entertainment that Hollywood has invested in that pro pro projects a certain kind of story about the United States. It's very powerful to Americans and to other people overseas. So and again, this is part of the way that ideology circulates. And the ideology that we've been talking about is nationalism and patriotism. That tells us it's good and heroic to go and fight for your country, defend freedom and justice, and so on, and even die. But let's not talk about all the various other kinds of messy things that can happen. So in the current wars that we're fighting, no memorials to all the hundreds of thousands of guys, men, women, who came back from the Gulf War, for example, uh, alive, uninjured on the surface, but suffering from various kinds of dis uh, illnesses that, that, that they can't figure out what they are. Right? That's a huge problem, but we don't want to talk about that. Um, you kind of already covered it, but I just I was just thinking that they, they don't want us to realize the harsh reality of like war never ends for the people who right. do come home. You know, they're fighting battles for the rest of their lives. Right. Mm -hmm. It's an important point. Because I think part of what the war story also tells us is wars begin and wars end on certain dates. So in the case of the Vietnam War, you know, you read the history book, then after the Vietnam War, there's usually a parenthetical set of dates. It varies a little bit. It could be 1961, 1964, 1965 at the beginning, it could be 1973, 1975 at the end, depending on how you how you slice it. This is a very artificial way of narrating a war. Because when we tell a war story, we want a beginning, a middle, and an end. So with these dates, it says the war began and the war ended. In reality, that's not how it works. Because if we want to understand how any war happens, we cannot begin with the date that the war starts. All the stuff that leads up to the war starting is incredibly important. So, in the case of the Vietnam War, I'm sure you talk, covered it, covered it, we'll cover it. Hundreds of years of history led up to the point of the Vietnam War happening. Uh, on that topic right there, how it happened, uh, the United States got involved with South Vietnamese problem with the North and the Communists. In 1961, I think, Eisenhower was the first general to send, I think, 4,000, and it went up to 16,000 when Kennedy took office in the early 60s. And it just got out of hand once, I think, the war machine, as a nice lady over there mentioned, to get a war started, you've got to get the people involved, just like Hitler did. And I'm not comparing Hitler to anybody in the United States, not anybody. But I'm just saying, good or bad war, depending on what side you're on, it has to get started. And you get started with the civilians first. You get their confidence, we're going to get involved in this war, or we're going to win the war. And it got out of hand, and it got up to almost a half a million GIs over there. And a, millions of people injured, civilians, who probably didn't want to fight either way, either side. You know how, you know? It happens. But yes, you're right. And the lady's right. You have to have a war machine to get a war going. And by taking classes like this, and listening to you share, trying to get us to really get a broad, view of a war, we have to see the pain it causes. Everybody involved, the immediate families of the veterans and all the families over the country who are fighting. And I think one of the things that uh, the American people are getting used to is the uh, United States, us, sticking our nose in everybody's business and accepting the fact that we're the world's policemen. Can't be that way for long. Something bad's going to happen. We need to back off, you know. Yeah, and this is also part of how war stories are shaped, limited, told in the United States. Because, you know, Johnny's offering us a story that's much more global. But the way that the Vietnam War is usually discussed, either in Hollywood or by politicians or maybe in history textbooks, is to be very contained. Partially through time. Begins in 1961, let's say, ends in 1975. It's simply not true. Because the war didn't end in 1975 for so many of the people who were involved in it. If you were a Southeast Asian, war was not over. A lot of bad stuff was yet to happen. If you were a veteran and you came back and you had PTSD, war was not over. You were still going to suffer, and you were going to make your family members and friends suffer as well. But the fiction of the war story is that when the ceasefire has been signed, the war is concluded. It helps us to contain the meaning of a war to say, well, Vietnam War was over in 1975. It's not. It's still going on for so many people. Right? 
states the name of the Vietnam War. It says Vietnam. And so for many Americans, if they've ever heard of the Vietnam War today, they'll think it happened in a little country called Vietnam. But as we're going to see, if we have time, it also involved Laos and Cambodia. Tremendous damage done to these countries. Actually, more damage done to these countries than to Vietnam. But most Americans don't know that. Part of the reason why is because the Vietnam War was not a war only about Vietnam. It was a war about all kinds of global economic political interests that the United States had that happened to concentrate on Vietnam. But we don't want to think about that because it makes things too difficult. We want to have a war that says two sides, two conflicts. When actually this, side, this war had many, many, many different participants, very, very complex war, whose ramifications are still being felt today. The reason why Obama, President Obama, is doing the Pacific pivot, if you've heard about that, is because all of those energies that were unleashed during the Vietnam War between China, Vietnam, and so on over the control of this era country, over this area, are still there. That's right. Ironically now, Vietnam wants to be allied with the United States in order to contain China. So those, that's all a part of the history that goes back to the 1960s, still this day. So would you say that everything, well, since America, everything is censored to us? Since it's just all black and white, we just see one way, and that once one is open to the other door, and we see that color, that affects us? So would you say that through Hollywood, we just see the whole black and white picture, but once Hollywood actually beat the color, that we would change our perspective and go against our government? Um, I think you were going to that. Um, what I mean, I think with artists, you can't change somebody's perspective. With yeah. artists, you can never. But I think it goes like before war, we don't understand their culture in general for the most part. You know, like me, I, I went, I was in Japan for three years. So you know, they're completely different. A lot of stuff that they would, that we would find weird or you know, not acceptable over over here. Um, but over there, you know, it's just regular everyday stuff. And then we get this painted picture of the people we go to war with that. They're using, especially like right now, um, you know, they're like using kids and, you know, the women as bombs and everything. And we get this, you know, this picture painted to us that these people are like right out of their houses, just shooting everywhere. When in reality, it's really not like that. You know, you go over there, the people are very curious. Like they'll come out, the kids, you know, they'll play with you and everything. But over here, if somebody came over here, we wouldn't be like that. We're a lot more like scared or sheltered, you know. So regardless, you can't change somebody's perspective, but that goes beyond like just culture. Yeah. And we're going to talk, I should probably get the images started now, but we're going to talk about the difficulties of changing people's perceptions. Like, to expect Hollywood to change its way of working, just to pick on Hollywood for, as an example, it's probably not going to happen. Because a Hollywood movie costs a couple hundred million dollars to make. Once you've invested a couple hundred million dollars, you don't want to get into the nuances. You don't want to think, I have to try to change 300 million Americans deeply held views about their country, their, their selves, their culture, and so on. So that's why Hollywood movies is probably the last place to begin looking for representations of the other sides and the complexities and the nuances. So ironically, you know, in the Vietnam War, I think the first people who started, Americans, who started to ask, well, what are the Vietnamese, for example, going through? They were probably poets. Because writing a poem doesn't cost you anything. You just go home and you write it. But one of the things that we're going to talk about is that memory is, cannot be discussed separate from the question of economy. That memories are shaped by economics. For example, uh, the United States lost the war in Vietnam, but it won the Vietnam War on film. This is the first time in history this has ever happened. Right? Usually the victors write history. In the case of the Vietnam War, the losers wrote the history. Because no matter what the Vietnamese say about the war, it doesn't get out of the country, except in very small ways. But American movies circulate all over the world, including in Vietnam. So memories are not something that only you or I think. Memories are also industrial products that are going to be shaped and fashioned by a country or society's economic power. Um, and then the other thing that was, brought, that was brought up, I think, that I wanted to address besides that, oh yes, the other major actor besides Hollywood are, are presidents in terms of the rhetoric that they put forth about how the war should be remembered. So we are now embarked on a 15-year campaign to commemorate the Vietnam War. This is a part of, a, um, I forget who, President Obama, I think, initiated this. So you can go online and you can read his statement that was given, I think, two years ago on Veterans Day, where he says the Vietnam War was, should be remembered as a war in which American soldiers uh, were valorous and sacrificed themselves in the cause of various noble things. That's the official state narrative of how the Vietnam War is to be remembered. That's very powerful. It is not anything like what 
we've talked about in this course, or what so many different people have experienced it, it is the state, through the figure of the president, and not just Democrats, but Republicans too, all presidents since the end of the Vietnam War have tried to turn the meaning of the war around from the, the period of dissension and conflict that it was in the 60s and 70s to a war that is about the sacrifice of the American soldier. So, no one wants to talk about whether the war was worth it or not. The way that the Vietnam War is remembered today is through the sacrifice of the American soldier who cannot be criticized. That is one of the major ideological triumphs of the Vietnam War. So supposedly, at the end of the war, veterans came home and they were not honored for what they, for what they did, right? The, the consequence of that now is we have this slogan, oppose the war, but support the truth in reference to the current wars that we're fighting. If you want to oppose the war, you still have to support the troops. It's a very powerful slogan, because what it does, it's a direct consequence of the Vietnam War, right? But what it does is that it diffuses war opposition. Actually, I do not understand how you can oppose the war and support the troops. If you oppose the war, you have to oppose the troops, too. They're the ones fighting the war. Even if they're not the ones responsible for the war, they're the ones fighting the war. I'm going to show you some images. Where Martin Luther King Jr., during the course of the Vietnam War, said, you have to oppose the war. Even if the war is being fought by a majority of poor white men and black men and Latinos, you still have to oppose the war. Even if you're supporting the cause of these poor 